Hello, welcome to this Melbourne webinar, looking at five ways to reconnect relationships within teams. My name is Jo Keeler and I will be with you for the next 45 minutes, but what we'll do is we'll be kind to people and we'll give them a few minutes to or a minute or so just to allow them to um, to join at this stream at this live stream on um, YouTube. So if you are on YouTube, if you're already here, could you please go into the comments and you'll see that you can type. There's a lovely little bit thing there says that you can type and let us know who you are and where you're joining us from. That would be wonderful. Just let us see who is here with us today. This gives everybody a chance to get into the stream and so we can start with a full house as opposed to people coming in in a few minutes time. Okay. Wonderful. We're here in Cambridge and just to say it keeps um, changing from a lovely blue sky to a lovely grey sky. So apologies if the lighting goes a little bit um, awry, I think is the word we're looking for. Um, hi, Gabby. I'm really glad you could join us. Thank you so much um, for coming on to the webinar. And then they all come in at once, don't they? Um, hello, lovely from South Africa. Hello there from Texas, from the Netherlands, from Leamington Spa. Oh, from Spain. Hi there. Um, oh, hi, Sharon. Lovely to see you on our webinar today. Um, from Thailand, um, Lincolnshire. Yes, Chris, it's, it's, it's not so great here. Um, from Relish in London. Hi there. Purple Shoots. Hi there. Lovely to meet you, Richard. Um, training manager from Just Eat. Brilliant. I'll order something later. Thank you so much um, for all joining in here. And it gives all of us a feel, doesn't it, of people who are joining us today and where they're joining us from. We find that we do have a very international audience at Belbin because Belbin is the global language of teams and it works in every country that um, we've got distributors in and more. So that's why we have such a Malaysia, Poland, Brazil, sorry, and hello, Hilary from Cambridge. She knows what the skies look like, the same as we do. Okay, let's make a start. Five ways to reconnect relationships within teams. Just to let you know, I do have Vicky with us as well today, Vicky Brown, and she is in the chat. I don't know if she wants to just introduce herself. Um, she is our Head of Research and Development at Belvin. And so she's there to answer all of your questions. Now, We've tried to keep this webinar slightly shorter than normal, so only 45 minutes. So we do want your questions, but what we've realized actually is you've all got such good questions that we never really allow the amount of time needed to be able to answer them properly. So we have put together a live Q&A session, um, which is gonna be next Thursday at one o'clock, and we'll give you the link to join in. Um, when we send you this, this recording. And that will give you the opportunity for you to put your cameras on and for you to be able to ask live questions regarding this webinar, perhaps a bit more of the practical stuff, the how do I do that? Um, what page is that? What button do I click? How much does that cost? All of those types of questions. And we'll be inviting all of you um, along to that live Q&A next Thursday at one. Let's make a start though on today's webinar, five ways to reconnect relationships within teams. I'm going to ask a question here and again you need to be on the old um, chat on YouTube and the question I'm going to ask is how many of you work in a team? And there's lots of different emojis you can choose, it could just be the first one which I think is the hand up, smiley face, whatever you would like to put, just how many of you work within a team? Let's get a feeling for that. Just click on that smiley face or just put yes, me. Um, you don't have to um, click on an emoji if you don't want to. That's absolutely fine. So I'm going to put my hand up. I work in, actually, I work in multiple teams. I think that's one of the questions, isn't it? How many teams do you work in? Okay. How many of you find it a rewarding experience? How many of you enjoy working with others within a team? How many of you embrace it? Um, how many of you um, enjoy working with it so much? Put your hand up again. How many of you really enjoy that? Oh, Carol, lots of different teams, same as me. Excellent. Okay, join various teams, Sue. Brilliant. Do you enjoy it? Put your hand up if you enjoy it. 
it's all gone awfully quiet, hasn't it? Awfully quiet. Okay, both rewarding and frustrating. And that's going to be my next question. How many of you find working in a team frustrating um, and less than rewarding experience, sometimes a little bit grating, sometimes it doesn't fill your heart with joy? And I'm going to be honest here as well, I'm going to put my hand up. Sometimes it isn't great, is it? Sometimes it just doesn't work. Sometimes it depends. It does depend on many different factors, doesn't it? How you feel when you're working with a team. There can be so many, you're in different teams, different people, different environment. It's not always plain sailing. Just quickly, put your hand up if you work by yourself. Some people are saying they're loving working in a team and somebody else is saying, not me. I'm enjoying this look on the chat. I might get a little bit too distracted. How many of you just work by yourself, nobody else? I can't put my hand up to this. Not many of you. Occasionally, I say if you do work by yourself, you're lucky people sometimes because it's a lot less hassle, isn't it? Anyway, <laughs> we get um, distracted there. Teamwork is difficult. We know this. Teamwork is hard. It's rare. But my goodness, when you harness it, it is so incredibly powerful. Not my words, but Lencioni. There is so much research, so much literature out there that really talks about the power of teams, how teams really are that link between strategy and execution. They are needed desperately for your teams to have that competitive edge. But it's hard. Teamwork is hard. It's not to be taken for granted. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it is incredible and you are amazed at what you've been able to achieve. And sometimes every day can be really frustrating. So, we know this, and this is what Belvin's here to do. We help teams day in, day out, um, to be able to help those teams work more effectively. And it's not just a 45-minute webinar, I'm afraid. You're going to need a lot more than that um, to be able to really help your teams reach their potential. But we'll see what we can do. We'll hopefully steer you in the right direction. Recently, I had the good fortune to get out of the office. Um, for those that know me, I'm a very strong resource investigator. And I was at an exhibition, an exhibition up in Edinburgh, a beautiful city. And it was the first chance I'd had for a while to really talk to people face to face with a cup of tea and talk to them about their challenges that they were currently having with their teams. And there was a theme running through this. And the theme was that people felt that there wasn't necessarily conflict per se within their teams, but there was a disconnect. And there seemed to be a disconnect between how people were working together. People seemed to be in their own individual silos, if that is such a thing, rather than working together particularly well. And this was a common theme. It wasn't just one person saying that. They just felt that their teams weren't quite firing on all cylinders, they weren't quite working, and people weren't communicating within their teams. And there can be lots of reasons for this, but it's not conflict per se, we're not looking at conflict, uh, problems with conflict. It's something a bit more than that. It was almost, yeah, everybody just disconnected. How can we make them reconnect, not just with the team, but one with, you know, with each other? So this is what we're going to be doing now, looking at five different ways you can help those reconnects within your team, help people work better together and hopefully make those teams more effective. Right, next page. <laughs> the key thing here, let me just go through my slides and I've forgotten the one that introduces myself, I do apologise. Um, the first slide and the first thing we're going to talk about here is purpose. Now, those that have been on Melbourne webinars before will know that this comes up time and time again. But we've noticed here at Melbourne, and like I say, this is what we do, we, we work with teams, is that we've found that unless everybody understands the purpose and the objective of the team, there can be disconnect. Because if people don't really understand that why they're doing something or the knock-on effect that it has, or what is it that they're meant to be doing, how are they gonna be measured? It can mean that they're not totally wedded to that team and disconnect can happen not just within the team, but with the stakeholders and everything else as well. 
So the first thing that we would recommend is that you spend time here. I must say this is always an area we always want to spend longer at because actually if you don't get this bit right, the rest of it sometimes isn't going to work particularly well either. Meredith Delvin has got a wonderful, if I can find a quote here actually, is that the merits of a team should never be assessed without first considering that purpose. So my recommendation, our recommendation would be is to check that everybody understands and they have the same objective. I'd also encourage everybody to act like a toddler. Um, do you remember that toddler stage? I don't know um, if, you, if you've got kids when everything was why, 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 why? Because <laughs> mum said so, why? Um, it's encourage questioning. So everybody within the team to question that they really do understand not just the overall objective, but why it is that it's being, um, yeah. what impact does it have? Why is that the objective? Throw in all the other W's as well, the what's, the why's, the when's, the where's, um, the who's as well, to really ask people to question what it is that the team is there to achieve. What effect does it have on the stakeholders? How does it link in with the five-year strategy of the organisation? Because sometimes if people can't see that, they can't find the purpose, the meaning, that they tend to be less engaged. And if people are less engaged and the relationships within that team are also less engaged, and that's where problems can start. So really reconnect with the team and question and question to make sure that everyone understands the purpose, the objective. Now I've got a book here, I'm sure you've all read this. Start with why. I love the back here and it says, it doesn't matter what you do, it matters why you do it. And I'm wondering if we've lost that a little bit over the last few years. And now it's got busier than ever, hasn't it? Everybody says how busy they are all of the time. And I wonder if, we've lo if we're losing that why. So what makes your heart sing? The, the connection you have, the emotional, not just up here, but the emotional connection we have that the work that we do. So I would recommend that you all try to find your whys, the why are you doing what it is that you do. And the connection with, with everybody else who interacts with the team, what it means to them. That's so important, isn't it? Not just the team, but the knock on, what it means to the stakeholders, what it means to the managers, what does it mean to the strategy over, what does it mean to the other teams? Are they dependent on you? Normally work isn't insular, it's normally linked in lots of other things. So really checking that everybody understands that. A great exercise we have, um, something that we use a lot is that we ask when we first meet a team and we're at that sort of what, what is your objective stage is we get everybody without conferring, without conferring, we ask everybody to write down on a post-it note about what they think the objectives of that team is. Um, and then they share them, they put all, they got their sticky pads and they share them, they stick, put them on a flip chart or however you want to do it. And it's very, very, very rare that we find complete similarity, you know, complete agreement, complete coherence of all of the objectives. And then it's a good idea to then use those as a springboard for the conversation to work out what the objective actually is. And you may have thought, perhaps a, you're a team manager, team leader, you may have thought that the objective was abundantly clear. Well, this is a really good way of checking that. Um, <laughs> just because it's clear to you doesn't mean it's clear to everybody else. Everybody sees something from their own viewpoint. So we need to check that we're all looking um, from, from the same point of view. We need to make sure the clarity is there. Okay. I just went down something because I always forget to mention this. Don't assume that the objective is static. And don't assume that just because the original team knows what the objective is, that people understand it if they're coming into the team for a short period of time, or perhaps they're joining the team afresh because, you know, teams change and we need to make sure we have that responsiveness to the environment in which we are in. So please come back to this just because you spent time right at the very beginning doesn't mean that that's always the case. You need to keep coming back, keep revisiting the objectives. Otherwise it slides a little bit. We need to make sure that's there. The other thing I 
always forget to mention is that sometimes when you're um, checking your objectives is that you've got too big a group to do that you're not perhaps a, a true team it could be that you've got more than 8 10 12 people now trying to get everybody agreeing on the same objectives when there's more than say six people around the table can be incredibly difficult what we recommend here is to break everybody down into sub teams into mini teams um, get agreement within each mini team and then bring everybody together each team mini team then shares what their outcomes are what the objectives they've agreed on and therefore everybody can feel far more part of the process because otherwise it can sometimes just be the ones who talk a lot and the ones who are always quite happy to contribute you sort of lead the way a little bit too much so to make sure that everybody does have a voice if you have too many people is to split that down into sub teams it really does work it really does work okay so you've got the objective sorted the second top tip is all about communication. Now, we don't mean at this point, how do you communicate with other people? Uh, we don't mean how to best start a conversation or how to best distribute work. No, at this point, we're talking about you. How do you best communicate how you work? Have you ever done that? Have you ever talked to anybody and said, this is how I work best? This is the environment in which I thrive. Um, this is how I do me. This is where my strengths are. Do we ever have those conversations right at the beginning? Perhaps we should have. Let's just, um, let me just go to the next slide here. Again, it's not just us at Belbin saying these things. We need explicit communication about tools and process. We need to make things clear. Um, Otherwise, it is difficult for the teams to work. And here again, making people aware of their own strengths results in better communication amongst team members and there's higher levels of performance. We know this is true. We need to start with self. What, how do we best work? What are our strengths? And how would we work with ourselves? Spend time here before you spend time on the team or on those individual relationships, because again, this is time well spent. So here's an exercise for you. It's okay, you don't have to write anything down on the chat. You can write it there on a bit of paper with a pen. Write down how you best prefer to work. How do you work best? It could be that you prefer a high, fast paced environment or perhaps more slower pace. Working with others, perhaps like working by yourself at the beginning of the project, at the end of the project. Maybe you're somebody who needs a lot of anxiety to work. Maybe you're somebody who just really can't deal with anxiety at all. How do you best work? Write it down. Have you ever written it down before? What about the environment? Do you like it to be, do you like to be by yourself online, you know, working remotely? Do you prefer to be working in an office with lots of people? Do you like to have lots of things going on at the same time? Or do you like to just work one thing at a time? Oh, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Now, I'm going to offer you a shortcut. So whilst you're thinking about this, how do you best work? For those of you who have one of these, this is mine, it's a Belvin individual report. You can actually make a start on this and really understand a little bit how you work best, what behaviours. So I'm going to go to page, oh, I can never find my right pages at the right time, page seven. I'm going to go to page seven of my report. I'll put my glasses on so I can read it. Um, it's anybody who knows it's this page here. You can't see it in detail there. Don't worry, I'm going to read it out. So it actually tells me my working environment. It says that I'm best suited to a fluid and unstructured job where events move swiftly, a role at the cutting edge of change, which offers you great scope and entails working under pressure. I'm likely to work best when I'm given free reign once the job has been specified in terms of goals and objectives. And it'd be a good idea for me to offer regular progress reports to show people that things are staying on track, <laughs> note to self. So this is telling me how I best work. This is a great shortcut, isn't it? I've also got things like be aware of. So I've got to be aware that sometimes I may act without sufficient thought sometimes. This is useful to know, finding out a little bit about myself. I can then go to the next page, page eight. This is what it looks like here. 
And this is looking at my top 40 molds. And this is giving me a language in which I can think about how to communicate the ways that I work best. So I could use phrases such as, I like to be given responsibility for grasping opportunities and driving things forward. Networking and enabling people to interact more effectively are what I do best. My strength lies in building better communications with others. And I like to take, take charge to ensure collective goals are met. So I've got this information about me and how I work best. I also know how to present it. If I go back to the previous page, it's a wonderful section. How would I present that? Let others see my enthusiasm. Tell them I'm happy to, to go and explore possibilities. Always happy to get out of the office, me. Um, this gives you so much information about how you work best. Use it. Spend some time here. There's some exercises um, that you can find online that help you take you through this report to understand you. Start with yourself. Now, I'm quite happy to share my report with you because actually it's not just what I think either. I've managed to get feedback from other people that I work with. Um, and they're saying that, yes, roughly, it's not exactly the same, but roughly other people see the strengths in the same way as I see my strengths. And this is really important because I know that the way that this is giving me advice on how I work best is backed up. It's not just on my say-so. And in fact, if I wanted to go to a step further, I could look at page 10 and look at those words that were used to describe me. How many times were they ticked? Broad an outlook, outgoing, competitive, caring, that's nice. Seize as opportunities, impulsive, that's in italics. Um, impatient, that's in italics. So I know as well from feedback how people know that I work. They can see my strengths. So we need to start with self. So when you're writing down, so write down how do I work best. If you've got one of these, it really, really helps because it gives you the language and the understanding of how you can do that. It also didn't mention anything about attention to detail um, <laughs> or about doing things in a methodical manner because that's not how I work best, okay? You can see what's not there by <laughs> where my strengths aren't. Anyway, I detract. So always make sure that you know your own strengths because if you know your own strengths, you can then start saying, next thing on your list of what to do, how would you best work with you? How I work best, how would I best work with me? Start thinking about how would, if you're working, how would you get the best out of yourself? Start with yourself and then you'll be able to go forward and to really help make those relationships brilliant. Okay. Next, let's go on to the next slide here. So you've looked at yourself, you understand your own strengths and your weaknesses. You understand where you work well, where you don't, your environment um, and everything else that is going to make you more productive and, and engaged. Because remember the Gallup work, if you place your strengths at least once a day, you're six times more likely to be engaged. So finding out your strengths is so critical. But not everybody's the same, are they? Once you've found out your own, you need to understand and appreciate difference and diversity because we know that not everybody wants to be treated in the same way as you. I'm going to show the next slide here. Um, treat people as they want to be treated and they'll do their best work. It's not treat people as you'd want to be treated, because if I treated everybody how I would like to be treated, I do know that that would ruffle a few feathers and I wouldn't have very strong working relationships. I have to think about how other people want to be treated. And to do that, you have to appreciate the fact that people are different. They approach work differently. They do things in a different way than you. So this is where we're going to concentrate for a little bit because actually it's where these differences come in and a lack of understanding difference, a lack of um, respecting difference sometimes, this is where problems really do happen. I mean, ideally, you know, we enjoy work when we work with people who are the same as us. We really enjoy that because we just understand each other. 
But to be perfectly honest, we're more productive when we work with people who are different. Um, we get more done um, when we're not the same. Albeit we want a little bit of overlap, we want some similarity there. But that's the way it works. We are, we enjoy, you know, work perhaps a bit too much sometimes when we're the same, but we need to actually have differences. I'm going to go through a little bit of this now. I'm going to use my good old trusted um, <laughs> my flip chart. It's so technical. Here we go. I'm using the flip chart here. Now we're going to start using the, the language of Belbin here, Belbin team roles. And we know from a, really from this point of view, thank you, that we know that each of these nine behaviours, these different nine ways of approaching our work and how we work with other people, we know that all of these behaviours are needed. The research shows that all nine are needed for a team to be successful. They're not needed all of the time, and that's the key thing, but that you do know, need to know where they are, um, depending on what the team is doing at that moment in time. So we all have all of these different behaviours, none of us are one thing, none of us are just yeah, one trick ponies. All of us have a variety of each of these behaviours that we can play. And sometimes we just have to, regardless if it's a strength, because the work just needs to be done. This is not an excuse. Just because I have very low complete to finisher doesn't mean that I'm allowed to make mistakes. So here we have all of these nine behaviours that are needed. Now, what we can see, we've got some social roles here. So we have the team worker, the coordinator, and the resource investigator. We have some thinking roles, the plant monitor evaluator specialist, and we have some action roles, the ones that get things done, the shaper, the completed finisher, and the implementer. Now, some of them have quite a natural opposite, and we'll just look at a couple of those um, right now. So let's look at the shaper behavior. So the shaper behavior is the one that's very task orientated, gets things done, gets things done quickly, very competitive, very, we will get there and we will get there now, thank you very much. Brings that energy and dynamism that sometimes a team needs to be able to hit um, deadlines, you know, that they are going to hit a deadline. There's no doubt about that. So they're very focused on the task. Now the opposite, the complete opposite behaviour of that is the team worker, because the team worker is less interested in the, in the deadline because they're interested in the people. They have wonderful listening skills, wonderful empathy. They, want, they are the gel that keep the team together. Um, they're the ones that everybody goes to. They're the ones who know everything. And unfortunately, they're also the ones that when they're not there, people go, my goodness, what's happening? The whole team isn't working. So these are two very, very different behaviors. Now, sometimes if there isn't respect that both of those behaviors are needed, this is where there can be some conflict. The team I said, these are people. Start thinking, we can't do that. People need a break. You're working them too hard. It's not about the people. I've just got to get the objective. It's all about the objective. I don't care how people feel. We've just got to get there. So they can have very, very differing ways of doing things, which can cause conflict. However, if they appreciate each other, so if the team worker appreciates the fact that actually they do need to hit deadlines, but not all here just to you know get on that there is work that needs to be done, we do need to push forward. And if the shaper does appreciate that actually people we need to care, we need to listen to how people are feeling, if they understand, appreciate that difference, that working relationship here is going to be far, far more productive. This is a really simplistic approach, okay, right now. You'd learn so much more of this um, if you went on to accreditation course or um, similar, because like I said, we're not just one thing, we're a whole mixture of things. We're not just one team. But this demonstrates, looking at these opposites, at just how important it is to respect and understand the diversity and the difference that you have within your team. And sometimes it's difficult, isn't it? Because there could be a culture within that team that maybe values some behaviours more than others. It's not unheard of. And so sometimes some voices are less likely to be heard than others because the collective of, of the others is too high. I'll give you an example. So in our office, we have Stephen. Now, Stephen is a complete programmer and luckily he's really high completed finisher and implementer. That's kind of where we want him, really. Um, 
Now, Liv is our training coordinator. She just started. Um, she's wonderful. And she's also a very high completer finisher, very high implementer. She's the one who makes sure all the manuals get out on time, all the instructions go out at the right time. We also have our operations director, Jill. Oops, I just dropped that one. And Jill is also very high implementer, very high completer finisher. Vicky is in the chat. So sorry, Vicky, but I'm going to put you down as well as implementer, completed finisher. So they're their top two roles. They have other roles as well. But you can imagine if the team was just here right now, that everything would be done in a very methodical way. There would be no mistakes. It would be all procedure. It would be hard working, really hard working. And then suddenly I come along. I come along with all that drive, that come on, energy, oh, what about this? Have you thought about that? These opportunities. Although it's needed, it can be sometimes quite difficult for the rest of the team, if the culture is like this, to be able to hear these because it's so different. So what we need to be able to do is ensure that even this happens, even if this is the culture of the team, and that they still value inputs from other behaviours. And again, this can cause problems within teams unless you really understand that actually I'm not here just to annoy. I'm here to do things sometimes a little bit differently. Um, I'm not here just to shout, but unless we get things done or out at a certain time, things are never going to go forward. It's understanding and appreciating the difference, which is really, really critical. Okay. Move this out of the way. This, by the way, the flip chart with the, can be used for so many different things. It's a wonderful way for the team to truly understand the contributions, not just of self, but also of everybody else within the team and understanding a little bit more about who should be involved and when they should be involved. I've just seen here, somebody said, is Richard Branson's perspective wrong? What do you think? I'll pass that back to you. Would you want to treat people as you'd want to be treated and they'll do their best work? Or would you want to treat people as they would want to be treated and they'll do their best work? It's not a wrong or right, it's just a difference, difference in opinion, a difference in perspective, um, different way of looking at things. Personally, I think if you do treat people as they would like to be treated, they would do their best work. Okay. So where have we got to? Understand that objective. Spend time here. Then concentrate on self, because self is incredibly important. How can you know which relationships you need to really work on? How do you know which relationships um, are more productive than others unless you understand yourself first? How do you prefer to work? Understand that of everybody else. Appreciate and understand difference. And that will make such a such a valuable contribution. One exercise you can do um, when you're, you're looking at the team, and it's worked brilliantly. I've used it before. I love it. In fact, it really gets the energy levels up in the room. I'm trying to find it now. Here it is. Have your individual report. And it's almost like speed dating. It's not quite speed dating, is it? But um, everybody sits in pairs and they have their individual report. And everybody has two or three minutes to talk about themselves and how they would work best. And the other person just has to listen with an appreciative ear. And then they listen and then they have a minute to feed back how they think that person would work best. Then they swap. And, you know, they, they compare again about how they would work best. And then you go on to the next person. Before you know it, you have so much energy in the room because you're beginning to realise how different people are to you and you're laughing. You say, my goodness, I couldn't possibly work like you. It's completely different to me. OK, well, if that's the case, how do we best work together? It's really important you do this. Um, and I was on a webinar, uh, somebody else's webinar a little while ago, and we also thought it'd be a really good idea to do this whenever you have a new starter. So invite the new starter to complete Belvin and sit down with a cup of coffee with everybody, just describing how they best work. You know, really start things well. Anyway, I'm giving up too many secrets now, but that's, that's the way we do things. And, you know, I think that exercise is fantastic. Next slide. Okay, so objective tick, your strengths tick, appreciating difference tick. What do we do now? 
Well, I would recommend that unless you want to keep coming back to this workshop every time, is you actually start writing things down um, and really look at a contract that you have within the team and write down the fact that this is how it's going to be in the future. We need to make sure that we have guidelines, we have rules. Rules is a bit harsh, isn't it? But we have agreement in the way in which the team is going to work together. And most teams would actually say, well, we know how we're going to work together. We know what those are, but they're more sort of implicit guidelines, the ones that everybody takes for granted. Um, sometimes people aren't too sure what they are. <laughs> they're unspoken rules. Um, may not be known to everybody, people may break, don't really know that they're doing it, broken unwittingly. What we need to do is spend time and actually have explicit, explicit um, guidelines, an explicit social contract. How is this team going to work together? And you're taking all of the information that you've already garnered from yourself and from everybody else, and you can use this as a start of a conversation. And you need buy-in from everybody to do this. That contract, contract we need, ugh, I can't get my words out, look. Um, you really do need to make that contract explicit. And together as a team, you can ask questions. You can ask questions such as, how do we avoid conflict? Do we challenge one another? Do we speak openly? Should we speak openly in front of managers? When do we do that? When do we say, actually, I'm not happy? How do we operate? Do we op operate under hierarchy? Are we wanting to work more collaboratively together? Do we work in silos? Do we create shared value when we're not working in silos? How engaged are we? What do we need to know? What don't we know as a team that we might need to know in the future? What don't we know yet? As a team, sit down with all of these questions to work out how best you're going to work together in the future. And keep coming back to this. It's really important that you come back because, again, these things aren't just done. It's not just a tick. Um, you need to keep evaluating them, coming back to them. If you had a team like this, I'm not going to bring it up because it's too noisy. Um, say, for example, it was full of social roles. So let's put some people over here. They're always talking, always looking at different ideas, perhaps it's shaper as well, a bit of energy, good at delegating, caring, listening, um, perhaps a bit of energy down there. If this is the team that you're working with, again, this is just a very simplistic <laughs> this is just for the purpose of this webinar. Um, if you're doing this, shouldn't you have a rule for when you listen to that strong monitor evaluator? Shouldn't you have a rule that says, actually, we need to make space and we need to slow down and we need to stop because we need to hear from the person who's getting all of that information and is weighing up the pros and the cons and is actually going to have a really, really good objective view of things. All of this needs to be part of the social contract. You can use the Belvin team reports to help you with this. It's ensuring that everybody is listened to and everybody is not just listened to, but given the space to be able to make that contribution because sometimes there are problems between individuals and teams because somebody never gets a look in. And it can be for lots of different reasons. But if you have a contract, a social explicit social contract, that says, hang on a minute, we need to make sure we involve Liv at these points. We need to give her space to make that contribution. That's really powerful stuff. And don't make assumptions. Don't make assumptions that anybody new that's in the team knows exactly what this contract is. At the last webinar, we spoke about making assumptions and real wariness of common sense. This is something that if somebody's new to the team, um, somebody who else is related to the team and maybe only for a short time, they need to know what that social contract is. It needs to be shared, it needs to be referred to. It doesn't want to be something that just stays on the S drive or stays under Google Docs and nobody ever, ever looks at it again. We want to make sure that this is something that people refer to time and time again. Um, I think Vicky's just put it in the, the chat, actually. Um, no. 
we have an article here, Belbin Teams and the Social Contract, which really does um, show you. If you want a copy of that, please do let us know and we can send it to you. Okay, just checking time there. How do you reconnect relationships with the team? Well, the first of all is the objectives. Secondly, it's finding out about you, start with yourself, and then understanding and appreciating the difference of others. Doing something practical about it, stop just making it just a, a workshop that nobody ever uses, but actually to write down how you are best going to work together, have that social contract. Here we go, I forgot that slide, look. And the key to improving the social, the working relationships is not only identifying and understanding behavioural differences, but making practical action, doing something with it. And then we've got that relationships in the virtual world, haven't we? And we're going to sort of finish looking at these things is how do you make sure that you can really reconnect those relationships virtually? Now, one thing which is linked with that social contract, isn't it? You can add into that is when people are working from home, when there's hybrid working, how do you best work together? And having those conversations is critical. There's some research, I can't remember the stats now, but um, it's quite high, the percentage of managers who, unless people are physically in front of them, they forget that there's people actually working from home. I know that occasionally I've done that and I'll put my hand up to it. I'm like, where is so? It's, oh my goodness, they're waiting on Zoom to join the meeting. Um, Put all of this in the social contract to make sure that you have those rules. What happens when somebody's working from home? One would also recommend, if you're going to reconnect relationships, is you meet at least once. Now, we used to give this advice before COVID. People used to say, how do teams work virtually? And we'd always come back. And Meredith was felt very strongly about this, that you need to meet somebody once once a year perhaps, not just once in your lifetime, um, to be able to get that, that chemistry. Um, so this is something um, that's really important. Meet at least once. Get the rules in. The other thing to do when you're working with virtual teams and your virtual world and you want to make sure you have the right connections within your, um, within your team is reassess how you do this rectangle thing. One of our um, trainers said to me, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Um, when you're in a meeting, a physical meeting, where everybody's sitting around the table, do you all stare at the person talking? And then when somebody else starts talking, you just stare at them. And then do you just stare at the next person who's talking? You don't do that, do you? You don't, you're writing things down, you're thinking, you're deliberating. You haven't got immediate eyeball contact the whole time when you're bound. So why do we expect it when we're on a Zoom call? Have those conversations. How do you expect somebody to react um, when working virtually? Have those rules down, because it could also be related to the team roles. Um, could be related to the team roles that somebody who is a high monitor evaluator, for example, somebody who is looking at the pros and cons. They don't perhaps want to engage. They're too busy sitting back, sort of listening to everything, deliberating. Allow that to happen. Don't make them think that they have to always engage. On that, actually, we do have some research we're undertaking looking at virtual working and team roles. Um, I'll ask Vicky to put it in the chat and we'll make sure we get it out to you. We'd love to get your feedback. Um, we'd love you to fill in a short questionnaire. It takes about three or four minutes so we can find out more about virtual working and, and Belbin. Um, so if you wouldn't mind um, doing that, that would be fab. We'll get the link to you um, at some point. Okay. You've heard me yakking on now for 45 minutes. I do apologize. We've covered heck of a lot of ground. We started with the objectives. We started at that self. Um, we looked at appreciating difference and diversity. Diversity. We looked at a social contract, writing it down, doing something practical to make sure that your team knows how everybody needs to work and the best ways that people work together. And we've briefly looked at those virtual relationships, the meeting at least once, and having some rules and guidelines to how you do this, making sure everybody is included. Thank you for your time. Do you know there's more to it than just five ways? There's so much more to this, but hopefully this has given you an idea, a viewpoint, a, a, just, just something to ponder over when you're working either within your own teams or you're helping other teams to become more effective. Hopefully it's given you some food for thought. Get in touch. 
team at belbin.com. It'd be wonderful to hear from you. You will be sent um, the recording. And I just had a moment of generosity. I just checked with the tech guys that we can do this. If you don't have your own Belbin report and you'd like to try one, email us at team at and we'll give you a 50% discount code. We will. And it makes it about £23, including that or something like that. So do that and we'll send you one. Um, the code will be valid until, I think they said Friday, and it's one use only. If you've already got your report, I think that's unfair. You can give that 50% to one other person if you'd like. You can be their best friend. Okay. Thank you so much for joining. Um, thank you so much for all your comments. Um, I hope that you found it useful. We'll go through the comments later to make sure that if anybody's got something that's really useful and we didn't get back to you, I'm sorry, um, to make sure that we do. But otherwise, if you've got more questions, look out for the email tomorrow, click on the link and join our, our YouTube chat next Thursday at one. You can have your cameras on. I'll be quiet. Thank you very much indeed. Have a lovely rest of the afternoon. Thank you.